WSOU 89.5 FM. I'm Valentino, and I'm joined today with Troy from Mastodon. How are you doing today, Troy? I'm doing fantastic. I've got a nice, fresh batch of coffee. I feel good. I got six and a half hours of sleep. So I'm, uh, I'm nine out of 10 stars right now. Good stuff. I know you got to like soak in all the sleep you can get before you go on tour. I know that that touring life is, uh, you know, is pretty rough in advance. So uh, are you excited at least to go back on tour this, uh, this fall? Very much so. Yeah, we, we got to, you know, we dipped our toes back in it this past month playing a few festivals around the United States. And, um, you know, you take two years off of anything and it's going to feel better, taste better, you know. So getting in front of people and playing music for people that were excited to be there was was very refreshing. And it felt great. Yeah, exactly. And I think that like, especially with a band like Mastodon, where, you know, yes, your, your music is incredible, but you're known for your live presence, your performance, you know what I mean? And I think that like uh, having that two year gap has to be has to be strange. I, I, what was it like just sitting at home and not having any tours even planned? Well, we didn't sit at home. And that was the best thing about 2020 is that when all of the touring got wiped away around March 2020, all four of us in the band were, were kind of starting to gear up with excitement to uh, dive into all the riffs and ideas that we had been collecting on the Emperor of Sand touring cycle for the two and a half years prior to the shutdown. So we kind of used 2020 to our advantage and, and wound up just working on music here in Atlanta with one another. Um, other than that, we were just at home alone all the time. So we kind of took a few weeks off when everything hit, but then we got right back into it and just started working on all this music that was pouring out. So, you know, that's what led up to so many songs on this new record of ours. So it worked out in our favor. All right. You know, and, and I love that, that the second the pandemic hit, you were like, all right, we're not going to stop. You know, like, we're not going to like, you know, just kind of like cease to, to do what we do. We're going to keep going full steam ahead. And um, that's a perfect segue into brand new album, Hushed and Grim, out tomorrow for all of our WSU listeners. How you feeling? Feels great, man. You know, anytime you work hard on, on any project at all, it's once it, you know, nears, uh, it's once it's, it's already, you know, through the completion stage, but now it's like being birthed into the world. And for those that are excited about it, um, it's, it's, re it's the reward, I guess, is when it's, that's when it becomes a real thing is when it's, when it's available to, to anyone and everyone who cares. So uh, I'm thrilled and I, I, all four of us are thrilled because, you know, it's, it's, it's taken a minute to get this done. So it feels great, man. And I know, you know, it's definitely taken a minute, but like it, it's worth the wait, you know, for all the fans that don't know, this is a double record. So 15 tracks, I counted the shortest track on the record was this first single pushing the tides, which is the only one under like, you know, that's like under five minutes. Um, tell me a little bit about writing such a lengthy record. Well, it wasn't intentional, but uh, like I said, once we had a full year to, you know, um, we had this timetable with no end. We could just create and, and write at our own speed and our own pace. And the fact that all four of us in the band were, were contributing lots of ideas and riffs and songs, you know, we started, we had 25 or more loose demos of song ideas uh, rather quickly. And that's more material than we've ever had before. So we kind of honed in on half of that, got them all to a structured spot where, where they were, you know, a, a good, a good, um, skeleton of a song, we realized that we had a ton of material and we had to kind of, we kind of had to stop and figure out what we were going to do. So we took the 15 songs we were working on and we just had the discussion of how we're going to trim this in half to, to, to record a new album. And then it, it, it uh, presented itself that nobody wanted to cut any songs because we worked pretty diligently on, on all of them and they had all started to create their own color and their own character, their own personality. And it worked as a big cohesive batch of tunes. So over time, the, the idea of, you know, why should we ever do a double album? It became, why shouldn't we do a double album? And nobody could have a good answer for that um, because it felt like one big, beautiful piece of, you know, of music, a collection of music. So, you know, what time, what better time than now and what better band than us to, to do a double album at this, at this, at this point? You know, I, I love that reasoning of like, you know, every, 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 you know, everyone says don't do it why not let's do it and i think for a band like mastodon especially um i mean as a fan of you guys 
it's super cool how this is 15 tracks. And again, like they're five minutes, six minutes, eight minutes. And I know every song and know exactly like, oh yeah, this is the song that kind of does that. So every song is memorable enough to stand on its own. Cause I feel like sometimes with those longer records, it kind of can all kind of like blend into one. But um, I, I think that's just a testament to the Mastodon songwriting. And again, the fact that you guys were, put a lot of a year's worth of just like fine tuning on this um, to make sure it was the best it could be. Tell me a little bit about the pacing of this record. Cause when you have such a lengthy record, I know that that's gotta be a topic of conversation of, okay, what songs go where, you know, I, I feel like, again, if you had put like sickle and peace, skeleton of splendor, and then like dagger and those three together, it would be almost like too long of like a slower vibe, you know, versus like, the way it's structured is also, I think, a really, really great way. But tell me a little bit about that pacing. Sure. Yeah. Cool, man. Thanks for that. Um, um, as far as sequencing goes, we always will, as individuals in the band, we'll just kind of put songs in order of how we would like to hear them, do repeated playbacks over and over, and make sure that you just like the ebb and flow of every song, because we intend on creating a uh, the solid listen from the first note to the very last note of the record. We want it to be ingested in, in full. So that's the intention. Um, and like you said, we were, we steered clear of putting the three darker or slower songs in a row because we didn't want to create that lull in the record. Um, but uh, sequencing, you know, we, we kind of all agreed on a, on what the record is relatively quickly. Um, and the reason is probably, which has also led us to, to having no fears about doing a double album is this is uh, sonically, this is the uh, the the most uh, ambitious record I think we've ever done because there's a lot of a uh, lot more emotion in in this whole record than we've ever done before on any previous records. There's slow, there's deep, there's dark, there's heavy, there's weird, there's trippy, um, there's bluesy, there's proggy. So we never on listening back, you know, of course we're going to be biased because we love what we're doing, but it didn't feel like a boring listen, and we felt comfortable with you know going for it with doing a double album, and then once we you know, quickly agreed on a, on a cool sequence that we all dug. That's it. It becomes final. You know, I, I, I love that answer because like I, I, when listening to this, I get exactly what you're saying. You know, I feel like every song itself has a new, a flair to it, a new flavor to it. You know, you're not trying to write tear drinker 15 times. It's like every track has its own personality. Yeah. And that's, that's the benefit of having a lot of time to work on tunes is that you kind of dig into the vibe of the song and just further the identity of what that song is, whether it, it, and sometimes that takes two days worth of just finding the right guitar tone to match the vibe of the song um, or, or tracking vocals to it. And it's like, you know what, that's not hitting as good as I thought it was in my head, come up with something else. Um, so having time on our side was very beneficial. And again, that's why we couldn't cut any of the songs once we had 15 completed because we had kind of dug in on each and every one of them and you kind of create these little babies and, and you love all your children. So you can't get rid of them. Exactly. Exactly. Um, that's, that's such a funny way to put it. Um, another kind of like question I kind of have in that vein is when you're writing these songs, I think what's cool about Mastodon tracks is that like, they sound very polished, but also very like rough. You know what I mean? Like they have, they walk that line really well. When you're in that post-production phase, specifically on this record, how do you walk that line? Yeah, it's a good one, man. Um, well, we want, it's, you know, we just we just have a discussion up front with, with whoever's mixing it. And, and you know, this new record was mixed and produced by David Bottrell. We just, you know, going from his previous body of work, it's like, hey, we really love the way a lot of the records that you do sound big and badass with clarity uh, and, and separation in a digital world where everything can be heard and felt. Um, but we're not looking for the crispiest, you know, pol most polished production that, that you can do. So um, it's just just agreeing on that fine line of, of uh, you know, staying authentic to the band's sound. Because if we can play great on the live environment, some, and, and it, it should match and marry as closely as possible the, the, the sounds of the record itself. So we don't want to get too polished, too clean. Keep it sounding like us and uh, be able to hear everything in a, in a, in a great way. That's the hope at least. Yeah. And I think it's so cool that you guys know that like 
before you even start recording, you know, you know exactly kind of the way you want them to sound because um, like, especially in rock radio and I know, you know, all, there's so many incredible rock radio bands that we love. Um, but like, I feel like the difference between rock radio and heavy metal radio is that like all the music is more polished and sometimes that works, but like, I, I, you need that rush rough edge sometimes, you know, you kind of need the songs to have a little bit of grit to them because that adds yeah. to the personality. Agree. And and we don't want to stray too far from the way we sound when we're in our practice space jamming as a four piece or on a stage. We don't want to vary, uh, you know, too drastically from from the way it sounds on tape. Exactly. And um, again, switching gears a bit, going into, into kind of like the live sound with a record like this, where you have 15 tracks and they're all really long. You know, you look at um, Gobbler of Dregs being eight minutes, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Um when creating a set list live, you know, you have this new album, you're going on tour with Opeth in the fall. Um, how do you know which ones to put in? You know what I mean? Like how to build that set list? Yeah, that's, I wouldn't say it's, it's the toughest thing we do, but that it's one of the toughest conversations we have because the more, the more longevity we have, the more records we have. And it's like, Hey, we have an hour set or whatever the time frame may be. How do you pick a set list? You know, cause we have lots of favorite songs as individuals that we want to play. We want to play a lot of the new stuff because it's the freshest and most exciting. But, you know, do we go out and just play the set list that the four of us want to play in here and not play any of the, you know, top 10 songs that are, you know, that we're known for? Or do we go in and just play all of the hits, if you will, uh, and sidestep the majority of the new album? So there's many angles of, of how to do it. But generally on a new album, which we intend to do this fall on the Opeth tour, is play as much of the new stuff as possible. Whatever our set is, which I believe is an hour and 15, we'll probably cover half of that set with brand new stuff. But we have to feather in some of the old ones just because um, there's been times when I go see a favorite band of mine and I haven't had a chance to ingest their new record yet. And if they play nothing but new stuff, um, it's cool to hear all this new stuff. But I walk out of there saying, man, I didn't recognize any of that. So that's kind of the, the you know, the attitude that we have is, is we want to sprinkle in everything from our you know, from maybe a song from our first record all the way up to the previous record and, and maybe half of this new one. But it's it's a not a difficult difficult discussion that we have in the band, but it's it's one that takes a minute to kind of please everybody because it's hard, man. I can only imagine. And, you know, like you're right, because you have a fan that's like seen Mastodon 30 times live, can't get enough, you know, no, seen all your hits. Like again, so like double digits amount, but they haven't seen any of the new stuff and they're dying to see that new stuff. They're filming at the mouth. But then you also have a fan who, like myself, who's loved Mastodon for a very long time, never seen you guys live and want to see the old stuff as well as the new stuff. You know what I mean? They want to see both. Um, so I, I just think it's so cool how you have to like kind of please everybody when doing a set list, you know? Yeah, we're aware that you can't please everybody, but we can surely try keeping all those, you know, all those, um, all those things in, in mind is, is that there's people here that are really loving our first few albums and they're still sticking with us. And there's people here, you know, brand new ears that we've uh, never played before, you know, in front of before. So um, we try not to be too selfish because we recognize that we have a great, incredible fan base across the country and across the globe. And, uh, you know, without them, we wouldn't be there in the first place. So we try to be aware of all that. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and, you know, as a fan base, I, we have like, we can detect what's genuine or not, you know, like we, we can understand if a band is like, hey, thank you so much for being a fan. We're going to we're going to try to play a little bit of this, a little bit of that versus like, you know, if, you know, as a fan, we kind of have radar of that. So it's super cool. That you guys are so supportive of the fans. Um, kind of switching gears have been going more into the songwriting. I know that lyrically, this record was a lot about your manager, Nick John, who had passed away, sadly. And um, you mentioned before how it kind of, this record feels like going through the stages of grief. Was it, do you think it's going to be difficult to play these songs live in like, in such a dark place when you were writing them? No, I'm very, very excited to play all this stuff live. Because uh, I'm very, you know, me personally and the other guys are very comfortable in sharing how we write and where it stems from and the inspiration. Um, although a lot of our records are, are just drenched in sadness and, and emotion because we, that's how we write, at least from a lyrical standpoint, as we pull from, you know, our, 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 our real life experiences and, and it's, it's, it's beneficial to us as individuals. Uh, it helps us create a, a, an authentic um, batch of lyrical subject matter. And with this record, like you kind of just touched on, I didn't realize it at the time, but it started very, you know, layered and anger and frustration. 
And a year later, when we're kind of putting the finishing touches on this record, it was a bit more uplifting with closure and the idea that, um, you know, having someone incredible touch your life and leaving is better than, than them never having entered your life at all. So, um, so yeah, it was very beneficial to us. And, and, uh, and it's also very relatable subject matter. Um, you know, we're not, uh, we're not, there's nothing fake about it. So if people dig in and like it, they can tell that it's very honest and true. Um, and for people that don't care for our band, that's fine, but you could never say that we're not authentic to ourselves because that would be uh, far from the truth. You know, that's such a great point because it, it, you're right. It's something we all deal with, you know, no matter who we are on earth, we're all going to have to have like a brush with death at some point. And with spe specifically with a lot of other bands, you know, you'll hear them like, be like, oh, this record's about this and this and this. But a lot of times you might not be able to hear in the music. Whereas with this record, I mean, like you start out with pain with an anchor, which just sounds like angry, you know, like that, that, that is an angry track. And then as you get through the record, like I genuinely feel like I'm going through these five stages of, you know, like anger, sadness, you know, denial. Um, and then at, the, at that very end, you know, those last two tracks, acceptance and that is such a cool thing to like actually be able to really really hear the message that you're trying to get across good that's that's that was the hope and the, you know the the intention um and uh we like the way it turned out for sure um and you know and if it touches someone in, a, in a, any positive way whatsoever then that's you know part of the magic of music exactly i perfectly put and again, I, I, another thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about diving into a new section over here is about the live stream aspect of the last year. Um, I know we talked a little bit about, um, you know, live performance getting on stage. In 2020, you guys have done a few live streams, even in 2021. Uh, I remember, my, you know, my best friend, John, he's like Mastodon's his favorite band of all time. He was like, Mastodon's doing a live stream on Adult Swim tonight. We have to check it out. And I, you know, we had a few people over, you know, we had, we had snacks and it was really exciting. And it was mind blowing what you guys did. Cause it was like black light, uh -huh. neon paint everywhere. Tell me a little bit about filming that, what that, that thought process was anything about that show in particular yeah you know we had spent the bulk of the year just in the practice space just working on all these tunes um, but when we had the opportunity for adult swim it was an actual you know like a gig um so we were very excited to do that we've worked with adult swim on several things before and, and we would pretty much jump at any opportunity to collaborate with them on that platform so it was a cool thing. It was it was exciting to do. And whenever there's enthusiasm and excitement, then that's usually the start of a, of a great thing. And uh, we just, you know, got a little creative with it, had the black light idea, neon paint and had some fun. And that was, you know, what, a year ago at this point, maybe September 2020. So it was just one of the highlights of the year and, and actually getting out of the, the uh, our, our creative space and just, you know, relearning some older tunes and, and having a little bit of fun. And I'm sure, especially like after being like, yes, you're working on this record, but you're not like doing live shows, you know, you're right. probably like really, really excited to just play music, you know, like get with the band, like ha have a show show, which is um, just awesome. Yeah, it was cool to kind of just take a little break with the new stuff and just revisit some old tracks and rehearse to do that, uh, do that, that live show. And um, another thing that you did over the 2020 pandemic was, of course, cooking with Mastodon. Um, I have to talk about this. Uh, where did that idea stem from? Are you, you know, do you consider yourself a bit of a chef? <laughs> uh, I enjoy cooking at home when I'm home, uh, which I've done a lot of this year. But uh, I wouldn't say I consider myself a, you know, a forward thinking chef of any, of any to any degree. Um, that idea came about is because everything was pretty, you know, doom and gloom. And outside of, you know, we take the music seriously and we always have for you know the past 21 years in Mastodon. Outside of that though, we're four, my bandmates are funny dudes and they're super laid back and have great, you know, open minds and attitudes and and we love to laugh. And and that's you know something we wanted to uh attempt bringing um to anybody that you know if we could share any positive giggles to anybody, that's that's a great thing. So I forgot where the initial idea came from, but uh we just went into this to this uh closed restaurant in in Atlanta and just had some fun one day. And it uh, turned out really, really great. The power of editing. <laughs> I love it. And sometimes some of those videos are like more fun to shoot than they are anything else. Like if you're just like, you know, like, you know, with a few friends, just like kind of having a great time, like that, that is such a cool stuff right there. I love it. Oh, actually, sorry for my uh, brain lapse. We were promoting the medium rarities 
album that we put out, Medium Rare, Chefs, and then the ideas spun. A local rec uh, restaurant owner offered us his restaurant for a day, and then we spun from there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, with Medium Rarities, I do want to ask, obviously you had a song on that called Fallen Torches that was on the Medium Rarities, but didn't quite make it to Hushed and Grim. Obviously, I know that wasn't like, you, did, you didn't write that song in that Hushed and Grim sessions, but was there another reason why like you didn't put it on the new record or put on that one instead? We had actually recorded that uh, right when we, in Atlanta, we have a building called Ember City, and it's a massive uh, rehearsal facility for a lot of local Atlanta bands in the basement. It's called West End Sound. It's a studio that opened up down there, which is where we recorded Hushed and Grimm. But when it opened a few years ago, we were the first band to go down there and record a new song just to kind of get in there, work with the engineer, Tom Tapley, in his, his new place. And that song busted out. And that was shortly after Nick John's passing. So it was very angry, very aggressive song. Um, so it worked well on, on both ends. You know, we're able to, to get a, a song of aggression out and check out this new studio that we had helped create. So we were sitting on it for maybe two years before Medium Rarities idea came together. So in order to have all these covers and previously unreleased songs of ours, we thought it'd be cool to put in a brand new song as well, knowing that a new record wouldn't be out for maybe a year or so after that anyway. So it was just kind of recorded as a one off with, you know, and then the idea of what do we do with this? Where does it belong? So it, it was uh, the opening track on Medium Rarities. Gotcha. And you know, what's interesting is like, even if I were to try to place it, like I know we talked earlier about kind of the rhythm of the, uh, of the album track list. I, I don't know where I would fit it on this record. You know what right. I mean? So it, it, you're right that it kind of like, it, it belongs there where, where its home is. Um, yeah. And another thing that I definitely wanted to talk to you about, it's going to be my last question with you today. I wanted to thank you so much again for sitting down, talking with WCU, talking with us. You know, we have um, Tear Drinker. We have Pushing the Tides in New Music right now. We're doing the track by track to all of our WCU listeners uh, that are listening to this or watching this on YouTube or our website. Um, that track by track is going to be starting this upcoming Monday. It's going to go a full week at the top of every hour. Tune in to hear a track from this new Mastodon record, Hushed and Grim. Um, thank you again so much for joining me today, Troy. My last question is, um, this is the first Mastodon record with like the absence of color. And I feel that like, you know, in terms of the, the color album, the, the, you know, the, the, the record, you know, insert. Mastodon has like a history of having like very, very colorful, you know, records and like, like stuff that's very, very, you know, eye poppy. I, I want to know, was it because of these like dark themes of death that this record, like this album cover is so dark or like like was it because of sonically the way the music sounds it was because it's so dark tell me a little bit about kind of that record cover we always whoever's doing our uh, album artwork we always have the conversation up front of of the emotion and the overall vibe that we would like because we always consider you know the the art of the album in full to be hand in hand with the music the liner notes the lyrics the album artwork everything should be one we were able to work with our dear friend, Paul Romano, once again, who's done three or four of our previous album art, uh, cover art. And from the get go, we just said, hey, the song is, is gonna be about this. And there's no way we can not write a song dedicated to and for our dear friend, Nick John, who Paul Romano was friends with as well. Um, he nailed it. He did a, you know, he put, puts, you know, pen to paper and then eventually, um, you know, ink to, to the canvas and he just knocked it out of the park and spent I don't know how many hundreds of hours on this massive nine panel uh, painting that he did. When it came time to the idea of color or not, it was like, hey man, this record is gonna be called Hushed and Grim. It is just drenched in sadness and, and you know, the, the overall uh, emotive uh, sonics of the record are, are dark. And um, it was the first time we were able to say, you know what, maybe no color would be best, very fitting you know, Hushed and Grimm gives you the bleak and, you know, not to overdo the doom and gloom on this record, but we just wanted it to be fitting of the emotional vibe that the four of us had going into the writing process and the recording process. And then I was like, hey, what color is the vinyl going to be? Gray. You know, let's, let's, if we're going all in, let's, let's stick to it. So yeah, it's in, you know, this is what album eight or nine or 10, I don't even know, but uh, it's cool that this will only help it stand alone as its own unique piece in the, in the ever evolving mastodon discography so we were cool with it being uh you know a bit drab but uh there's enough art in there to be interesting for uh, for days and days exactly um you know you're so right that like 
it, it it'll stick out you know across the other mastodon records but like if you look at the lyrics and even like a surface level you know deep themes you're like oh yeah no this is this is the sad one this is the dark one so um thank you so much again troy for you know talking with me today you know um new album hushed and grim out tomorrow and furthermore you guys are going on tour with opeth in the fall for all of our new jersey and new york listeners you guys are coming to hammerstein ballroom on november 20th so you can check you guys out there thank you so much again Thank you. You guys are great.